There's a lot of fear in our community. There's a lot of need to be validated and loved by enemies in our community. There's a lot of need to work on who you are because it is something that you despise. So hatred and matricide are deep. And it seems like they're growing deeper. But what I see in front of me tells me that it's not victorious. And there's one person sitting here, then that means that we haven't lost. And we have a lot of work to do, and we need to focus our attention on our children. Because they're the ones who are the primary targets right now on this yeah. issue and every other issue of insanity. It turns us into somebody who we are not. If we're going to win, we have to produce warriors. Initiated, student of the EWA, so baptized by the Wobia teachers. I'm trained and learning how to shoot the game. While you burn the same playing video games, this message here is for the RPG Brigade. Shed blood, bring peace, that's the warrior's way. Libation is the blood, sweat and tears. E by I say I'm bringing death to the quiz. I'm on the list, so I die for the kids. Black smack gangsters coming home from bigs. Free your dome, you only hard to kill your own. A straight race trader, the white man's clone. Marita, man, I'ma continue to plan. Chuck the life out of a cracker, grip my bare hands. That's my word, my deed, and my thought. From sun up to sundown, true warriors fall. This needs to be emulated everywhere we are at. Those people who are calling themselves warriors, well, the root word of warrior is war. And either you're playing games and trying to be a fake thug, or you really are about the business of protecting your community because you realize that we are at war. And you act like we are at war, not yeah. like we are at peace. Firm handshake, look a brother in the eyes so I can tell him be fake. I can see through the disguise if he got a full tongue. Speaking disrespectful lies, I sought to pop up a boot, respect him because he wise. Go. I side for dropping wisdom on the pages, so stand up and be courageous. Our enemies engaging with grenades and shoddy gauges. With machetes, with the razors, with the stick or with the stone, or being up to their faces. Got a hatred for the races, of the times and for the traitors. Won't forget about the lunches. How they fed us to the gators, who gates us, protect their neighbors. Won't betray us for some paper. Our secrets keep it sacred. Our legacies the greatest, take the greatest, cause they hate us, they some haters. I'm dropping like an anchor with the hopes that it'll change us. The artificial flavors. You want to be a player while they hang it, so what team you playing for, the underdog or for the face? Right. Warriors are supposed to be about the business of defending those people in their community. They're supposed to be about the business of making people comfortable, giving them a space, safe space. People say warriors are healers, and they are. Sometimes healing is that tough love thing where you got to handle people in a particular way. But our job is to make it so that our people have all obstacles removed from their way of being African. program with Mwalamu and Yad Baruti. Uh, if you'd like to call in um, with questions, uh, the number is 760-569-7676. Participation code 948656, followed by the pound sign. Okay, um, tonight's topic is reparations. And, in fact, we came up with this topic. Uh, Brother Broody asked me, what are we talking about? And I was wearing a reparations T-shirt that I bought um, some years ago. I don't even remember where. But um, there's reparations at the top. There's an African man uh, enslaved. He's in chains. And there are columns of... Uh, reasons as to why we should um, receive reparations, the harm that's been uh, done to us. Um, well, first, want to start with 
And I didn't think about this um, a, a subtitle for the program until after afterward. But uh, I was thinking, seeking repair for the irreparable, or some people may say irreparable, that which cannot be repaired. That's what reparation for us, you know, the magnitude of what has been done. Uh, and as one of our ancestral mothers has said, America owes a debt to African people that she can never repay. But even maybe we have some people online who may not be clear about exactly what reparations mean. So I, um, and actually, uh, in thinking about our program tonight, we did, uh, we focused on reparations at Ankaben Institute today. Um, we started with looking up the definition of reparations because we, we did have children, um, even though if they've been at Ankaben long enough, they've heard it, but even sometimes they hear and don't remember, and even some who had not heard about it or uh, can't recall, but anyway, uh, definitions include uh, a repairing or keeping in repair. And of course, the notion being to repair something, something has been broken, it's been harmed in some way. Uh, two, the act of making amends, offering expiation uh, or giving satisfaction for wrong or injury compensation in money or materials for damages or injury, um, compensation paid to a defeated nation for damages caused by another nation. And of course, all of these things would uh, apply to us. We haven't, we don't accept total defeat, but definitely the devastation and the destruction of us as a nation is clear. And um, it's clear that we are old. And um, before I go through my list, and actually, so I used my T-shirt uh, to come up with the list of reasons uh, as to why, because I thought they did a, a good job of kind of giving an overview as to why uh, we deserve reparations. But I definitely want to mention the organization that, um, has been spearheading this movement in this country uh, for some time now uh, called NCOBRA, which stands for National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations Association. And definitely um, want to mention that Queen Mother Moore uh, worked diligently in as uh, reparations was part of her platform, what she worked toward, but also one of our more recent uh, elders and someone, Bob Rudy and I, were blessed to have actually known personally uh, Baba Hannibal Afrique um, was uh, president at some period, uh, but even when he wasn't president, he continued to work with Encobra until his transition uh, almost two years ago now. But, um, so now, of course, this is a t-shirt, so you have things are not listed in a chronological order. And I wanted, I'll wanted i start with the t-shirt, and then uh, things that are not specified in the t-shirt, or I want to, you know, add as well. But being segregated. Uh, now, on the one hand, <laughs> that was a good thing, but in terms of, uh, being given inferior, so the segregated schools, segregation, segregated schools, I think neighborhoods, that's all good for me, but the uh, unequal uh, finances in those cases, that went hand in hand. Uh, but segregated was on the list, so actually that's one I have to qualify. Uh, in fact, integration, those of us who are studying our story realize it was the downfall of our sense of unity, working together, being having independent neighborhoods, businesses, but in the way that it was used to um, inferiorize us from that perspective, uh, segregation. Now, something on the list raffled 
prior to purchasing that T-shirt, I had not heard of uh, our people being raffled, but that in no way surprises me uh, because, you know, if you murder, rape, kill, steal, raffling, you know, auction, so that, you know, would be minor compared to everything else you do. But when you don't res respect humans as such and you treat them as animals, in fact, you know, we have been treated worse than animals, um, that nothing, when we hear about things that we have not heretofore known, we should not be surprised because, you know, apparently there is no limit to their desire uh, to spread death, domination, and destruction. So um, just something new that you may not have heard of. Uh, our forced breeding in order to um, bring additional enslaved people into the world to uh, build this corrupt nation uh, was a major part of our story. Um, now they mention, they will mention um, a few our historical particulars like Dred Scott um, and in fact I stopped for a second to look that up. I knew it was one of the many things without um, remembering the details but he was an enslaved African who's um, enslaving the monster enslaver had moved to two different states that were free and then at some point returned to a uh, slave state and um, Dred Scott because he had lived in two free states tried to sue for his freedom and Surprise, surprise, he lost. But it was on the list. Um, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, definitely, I guess most of us are familiar with that. And it's so interesting to me that uh, in the year 2013, I just heard on the news last week or this week, uh, another black family had a uh, cross, this was in the state of Georgia, a cross burned in their yard. So, you know, the Ku Klux Klan remains active uh, and not necessarily in their robes anymore, or you don't have to be an official card-carrying member, but that same mentality of trying to terrorize uh, people. And the family, of course, say it. You know, they're in their home, they glance out the window, and they see fire. And so, you know, them not being able to sleep at night, not that night, wondering would somebody, you know, come and set the house on fire. But, you know, they say the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, the slave trade, in which Brother Brewery likes to point out, trade indicates some um, sense of there being things of equal value being exchanged. So it was not a trade. Africans weren't trading us. It was, you know, kidnapping and theft on a massive scale. But that whole process, you know, that was a major part of what Mom Rambani refers to as the Ma'afa, uh, the destruction of us as life as we knew it and who we were at a people at that time uh, prior to the madness. Uh, mutilation is on this list, and we know those of us who watched Roots a lot of problems with that mini series, but uh, the good thing is if you can see the problems but focus on the positive was introducing to people um, a little more insight into what happened to our ancestors. Because in general we knew, okay, they had been enslaved, slavery was bad, but Lincoln freed the slaves, and you know, then there was the Civil Rights Movement. But you got to see uh, Kunta Kinte in that case foot being cut off um, so that would prevent him from running away but wouldn't prevent him from you know being of service uh, as an enslaved African uh, being auctioned and of course and that's something uh, definitely parents you know it is available uh, in fact we purchased it years ago so that we we show it to the students 
Not every year. We ideally we do it every year. Sometimes the schedule didn't permit, but uh, even the same students watching it over because we want visual images can be very important and definitely they're uh, much more uh, vivid and more impactful than just you know reading a traditional social studies book or even reading. Uh, African American history book by someone who does a better job than the standard school books, but having visual images, you know, makes the world of difference. Uh, being branded, uh, you know, like as animals were when we were enslaved, and uh, unfortunately, uh, and I saw this in college and teaching on college campuses uh, are. Uh, young people branding themselves, you know, with Greek insignia, the Greek letters of their fraternity. To my now, I didn't see sisters, but that wouldn't surprise me. You know, when we follow other people's madness, and it's very sad to look at the things that we should receive reparations for, many of those things uh, we're doing to ourselves. We take, or we are embracing the culture and the people who inflicted um, these horrific acts upon our ancestors. And definitely even before I, I get to the end of my list, I seriously want to point out that uh, the reasons for our reparations do not end with slavery or the civil rights movement. Because as I just said, the family, black family in Georgia recently uh, cross burned in their yard. Uh, what's going on today continues, and you know, of course, today the the new enslavement is the prison system, that the prison industrial complex. So again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So not only we have the physical slavery, but then the mental, emotional, spiritual enslavement that continues today. Uh, the Jim Crow laws, of course, forced to uh, limit our true freedom, um, the Willie Lynch syndrome, the uh, teaching of us, and that's one of uh, the most detrimental things when you have uh, created menticide in a people, then they don't have to be physically enslaved, and, uh, chained, handcuffed anymore. So you can handcuff whatever portion so you can make money off the prison industrial uh, complex, but also um, if they're mentally enslaved, you don't have to do that because they work against themselves. They that that self hatred, which is somewhere on this list, um, prevents them from seeing you as the enemy, and in fact, they see each other as the enemy. So they keep each other down. You don't have to do that. That's being done for you, you know, by enslaving people's minds. So I would definitely say, you know, that was worse. This is worse than our physical enslavement because when we were physically enslaved, the majority of us realized that was very wrong and did everything we could to change that situation. But when people are mentally enslaved, they think that they're free, so they have no desire to be free. Their desire is to become one with their enslavers. Uh, that Stockholm syndrome when someone is kidnapped and they fall in love with the kidnapper. Um, we definitely are being victimized by that. Uh, he mentioned Howard Beach and unfortunately, you know, I used to be able to keep up with the different names and places so I know uh, this is in New York and some um, a young black man, but the particulars, the cases are so many. You know, you can remember the most recent, okay, Trayvon Martin, or you, you remember bits and pieces, but they're just too numerous to remember. But one of the many times, I think a young black man in a white neighborhood after dark, accidentally in the neighborhood, was killed. But again, the stories are so numerous, you can't keep up with them. Um, are people being bombed uh, when I show the children um, what We've shown children, uh, four little girls, when the church uh, was bombed um, and four black girls were was killed, but they see the king 
uh, biography movie in which his house was bombed. They sing, you know, Megar Evers. But, you know, that was one of their uh, means of terrorizing uh, our people. So it's interesting now that they're claiming to be terrorized when these are the acts, things that they have done. Uh, they just find other ways to terrorize us today. Like uh, if you live in our neighborhood, black neighborhoods that we know of, I guess if, well, we don't, you know, we're not in the wealthy black neighborhoods, but you can't go out of your door without seeing police lights, and they're not looking for these murderers, rapists. They're giving people traffic citations. So, you know, you can't drive down the street without being harassed. Um, being hunted like animals, uh, when we had the courage to uh, escape the madness in search of our freedom. Uh, things like the Tuskegee experiment uh, is on the shirt. People of a certain age are familiar with that. Younger people, uh, if we have any younger listeners, um, this is in Tuskegee, Alabama, where the government knowingly um, did not treat black men who had syphilis in order to watch to see uh, what would happen to them, but all the while telling them they were giving them placebos. They, they're given medicine, but the whole goal was to see the effects of syphilis. And unfortunately, there was a black nurse who was involved with that. And, you know, again, surprise, surprise, how we participate in our, our own genocide um, knowingly in many cases, but also unknowingly. So those Negroes who would kill every African centered black person in order to keep him or herself, um, you know, as a house Negro getting the crumbs off the table, you know, that madness continues. Emmett Till was mentioned, uh, parents, if you have children, if you haven't shown them the picture, you, all you have to do is Google it and the pictures come up. We recently showed our students again. We want to, you know, whenever his name comes up and that one of the good things about the computer, um, something, you know, we need to be reminded of. And in fact, speaking about our men aside, um, the reason Emmett Till came up in class that day, I had read an article about, I think it's Lil Wayne, one of the uh, rappers um, had has an allusion to Emmett Till in uh, one of his songs, you know, totally uh, being disrespectful. This young man was murdered and, you know, using it as something I can't even remember. I can't keep up with the madness. But uh, and someone told me, oh, he, this is not somebody who's clueless and he's just heard this name, that whoever this rapper is, I think it was Lil Wayne, but he, he knows who Emmett Till was but has no problem, you know, that we can make fun, make jokes about something that's very serious. A uh, 13-year-old boy visiting relatives in Mississippi in the 50s and was accused of whistling at this white female, and they come and take him from his family that he's visiting uh, their home and kill him and throw him in the river. And when they find him, his body is bloated beyond recognition. His mother could only identify him uh, because he was wearing his uh, ancestor father's ring. But, um, you know, the picture of his bloated uh, body it's a, just a, was a, a, a major factor in the civil rights movement because his mother gave permission for that. Instead of hiding, keeping his body covered, the world got to see. And that picture is a, a good um, symbol of who they are as a people. And, you know, this was a 13-year-old boy, so, of course, you know, um, their treatment of our people. Sharecropping, you know, how uh, it was a misnomer because there was no sharing. It w totally exploited our people and that it was a new form of slavery, uh, that you weren't physically 
handcuffed or chained on a plantation, but you can never get out of debt because you were being cheated. So, um, and people are familiar with that. Uh, Rodney King is mentioned, and that was just another something. You know, we have from time to time visuals that really help us for a moment somehow because we quickly forget. But uh, watching him being beat down by several officers, and they have him down, and they just continue to beat him. Uh, I'm like Trayvon Martin. We hear the story, but you don't have the visual, and it wasn't to the same degree, say, of, as these police officers. Um, uh, looking as if they're trying to kill him. Um, and then, you know, you see the mental side in him, can't we all just get along? Uh, can you get along with your enemy? I don't think so. Um, kidnapped is on this list, and of course, you know, that was the beginning um, for our ancestors who were brought over here. Of course, we know uh, we were colonized on the continent, but that was a major part in our story of the ancestors who came over, the kidnapping, and uh, of course, along with that, not specified on my t-shirt, but that went hand in hand with the beatings and the murders and the rape, rape is on the t-shirt. They mentioned the Missouri Compromise, and you know, that's part of the battle between uh, the North and the South um, in terms of what states could remain, could uh, would no longer allow slavery. But, you know, for those of us with a clue, we recognize they were brothers, two sides of the same coin, having disagreements, but that um, we found out, those of us who migrated to the North, fleeing, you know, the segregation, the Jim Crow, uh, the fear and exploitation of the South found another version of it, you know, in the North. Uh, Clarence Thomas is on the list. Supreme Court Justice, who only thing identifies him as black is his skin. Uh, he doesn't even have uh, respect for his own family members. I remember uh, years ago him um, demeaning his sister publicly because she was on public assistance. Uh, but, you know, with his white wife and his embracing of the European way, no surprise. And then, of course, his becoming a Supreme Court Justice, you know, was part perfect in terms of us having overcome, you know, a different uh, justice from Thurgood Marshall, uh, the first black one. Uh, are being tortured, you know, that was daily life. Uh, we are today in different ways. Uh, Bull Connor, one of many, just one name, you know, he, uh, an association with uh, a vicious law enforcement officer, whatever, public safety commissioner, whatever he was in the South. But, you know, just one of many, and just one whose name uh, we got to hear in the civil rights movement or when we read about that period of time. Uh, Amos and Andy. Now, of course, the black comedy today was a black comedy. Um, ridicule, ridiculing us, the stereotypes, and black people were so upset. But, you know, we have different versions of that today. Black comedy, unfortunately, you know, it's um, built on the stereotypes. Uh, in one way or another, because of course, well, we don't own the media. So uh, white Jews who are white uh, own the media, they're only going to support and have programs on that uh, support their agenda. So I remember one black drama on over the years, and I, I, unfortunately, I grew up as a TV watcher, and they snatched it off very quickly. Now, I don't have cable, so I don't know, but I still, well, okay, and Soul Food, I, I've heard of that, haven't seen it because I don't do cable, but anyway, it's, um, those are rare. Now, these reality shows, comedies, whenever we're being stereotyped, in negative ways, those shows, you know, are in abundance. Uh, poll taxes, which interesting, that was the past, you know, uh, 
a way of trying to prevent black people from voting. Today, they're, you know, using the identification and trying to change the voting laws and get rid of the Voting Rights Act. You know, again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, white supremacy, that uh, attempt, we know that they are not supreme, but their attempt to um, dominate all others that, you know, remain strong. And in fact, you know, not limited here, everywhere, and that's their story, everywhere they go in the world, um, it's about, they spread death, domination, and destruction. But of course, if that's who you are as a people, then that's what you do. Uh, the fugitive slave laws, again, you know, a specific reference to the period of time we were enslaved, which meant it wasn't enough to just be able to escape your plantation and go into quote unquote free land because there was a fugitive slave law which meant that you could just be caught and be taken back. So and that's part of our story of us having to go to Canada, having to, you know, literally leave the country uh in search of freedom. Uh now rape is on a T shirt, but I definitely pointed out to the students this morning and this wasn't the first time Broody and I point out to them we hear about the rape of the women and even, you know, our, the mixed children that resulted from those relationships. So it was clear that the women were raped. And we know, if we know Sally Hemmons, that, a famous story, you know, raped. So, uh, how can a, a teenage girl be a mistress of uh, president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson? But um, the, so we know girls and women were raped, but knowing, as we learn more about who they are, and we learn that they are homosexual, then uh, I'm sure it's only logical, uh, homosexuals who are raping today, why would they not rape? They rape their own children, so why would they not rape the black men? And of course, they would have to have help, but you know, they have the mob mentality so they would be able to do that. Uh, are people being bought and sold as if they were animals? You know, a major uh, reason that we are owed reparations. And, you know, the Holocaust, uh, Mama Remba uses the term Ma'afa, which uh, translates the great destruction, but the whole experience uh, mentioned on the T-shirt, infiltration. Uh, you know, of course, COINTELPRO, the uh, part of the FBI whose job was their counterintelligence program. That, uh, it was designed to find and um, destroy any black organization that, or individual or organization that was working toward uh, helping our people. And of course, they were. Um, uh, able to uh, divide it by infiltrating, destroy, you know, Fred Hampton um, killed in his apartment by someone having infiltrated, uh, you know, the destruction of the Black Panthers, uh, but any African Liberation Army, any uh, group that want, wanted freedom for us. And of course, you know, we still get infiltrated. So I'm sure for all of us who are still fighting for our, our reparations, I mean, pardon me, our liberation, that there are those among us, if uh, we're perceived in any way as uh, having some impact on our people, that there are those who are pretending, you know, to support what we're doing, but they're working for the government. And you know how many people would do it for free, you know, um, because, again, mental side. Um, the experience of slavery, of course, and, you know, uh, and I'm still going down my list. The Middle Passage, and, of course, Bob Rudy likes to talk about that, that that term is so, uh, and uh, such an understatement as to what happened to us because it denotes none of the terror and horrors of what happened, and um, hopefully Baba will mention, I don't have any for, in, in Toriasi, okay, um, and I don't have the term in front of me, uh, 
the so-called Tulsa riots, and Rudy was telling the students today, uh, the, the so-called riots were, like, in Tulsa, those were riots, and the Red Summer, those were riots against black people by white people in their efforts, their jealousy at us having a strong economy in our neighborhoods, and their taking, forcefully taking what belonged to us. Uh, and even when the so-called riots where we were rebellion, something else, Bob, we pointed out to the students many times, those were rebellions making that distinction. But even when we were forced to do that, we were being forced because that's not who we are versus uh, terrorizers. That's who they are. Um, the lynchings a prime example of that. How clearly, okay, you snatch someone up, lynch them, and of course, and uh, FYI, if anybody doesn't know, um, women and children were also lynched. Um, there is a book. Unfortunately, the um, authors or the compilers, because it's a, a book of pictures without sanctuary it's a we show uh we when we bought the book we didn't know it's by two white uh homosexuals but the pictures of lynchings it's something good again like roots the visuals our children need to see because it's one thing for you to tell them oh so many thousand of our ancestors were lynched it's another thing when they actually look at the book and uh in that book uh, many of the pictures come from postcards that were made. You know, when you travel today, you buy a postcard, you send it home and let your friends know the sites that you're seeing, your family members. They would send it to their family members. Like one picture I recall, um, there's a son who sent this postcard to his mother, and he said, uh, I was at a barbecue last night, your son, Joe, something like that. But so there's a picture of a black man who has been lynched, but also his body had been burned. And if we have any young listeners, so that was part of it. They wouldn't just hang you. Uh, they would hang you, uh, maybe castrate you, as well as set you on fire. Sometimes, you know, setting us on fire even when we were alive. And there are pictures of that. So the book is good without sanctuary for from that respect. Uh, hate supporting the... Uh, financially supporting by buying the book, but I think uh, it will be worthwhile. We, Our children, we at least need to have it in a family. So if it's one in the family, then everybody's children and grandchildren, you know, we could make sure that they see. But we need to see that. Um, oh, but uh, late when, once I found out who had done the book and I realized what's going on, uh, homosexuals help to support um, black issues so that when it was their time, when America was ready for them to come forth with their movement, they would have support. So there's always, you know, an ulterior motive. But sometimes in their ulterior motive, even problems with roots, but if we can use it for what we need, for our teaching purposes, but also you know, informing our children, okay, so these pictures, what we need to do, we don't then fall in love with or, you know, fight for the rights of homosexuals because they did this book. Um, where was I? Um, the ghettos is on the list. Um, now, and that's interesting, we have complained about them because, of course, you know, putting people in unlivable conditions, but what's going on now, they're getting rid of public housing, so it's bad enough when you have poor substandard housing, but you're putting people in a position where they have no housing, and it's practically illegal, depending on where you live, to be homeless, because you have, it's illegal to sleep on the street or sleep in a public park. But as we tell the children, that's, you know, the insane society that we live in. So we, we uh, won't put in place the things that you need to support yourself. But if you find yourself without support, we're
we're not going to support you, but we will penalize you. You know, we'll give you a bus ticket maybe to get you out of our city and send you somewhere else versus um, trying to help you or not doing the things that lead to that in the first place. Um, Uncle Tom is on here and had to explain to the students, Uncle Tom, uh, people of a certain age have heard that, uh, but um, refers to a character in, in Uncle Tom's Cattle written by one of those liberal hearted whites who wanted slavery to end. But the notion, the title character is Uncle Tom, and his character is a good servant to the white family that he serves. So, you know, we use that for black people. I think now we've moved past Uncle Tom, and uh, which is a masculine denotation, and we just say Negroes, those people who love white folks more than life itself. Uh, and in fact, I was just looking at a quote by Nana Omawali Malcolm X, who said, if there's anything I hate worse than black men who love white women, it's black men who love white men. So, but today, that you know, it's all rolled up into one. Uh, convict leasing, and I know I recently um, saw a PBS uh, special on this. So this was another way. They came up with multiple ways after our after the Emancipation Proclamation to enslave us legally. And one of them was, you know, you could just for any reason uh, be thrown into jail, and then they would lease you out. You know, and similar to today, uh, incarcerate our incarcerated people who are making shoes for corporations for these prisons that are privately owned today. So, you know, they're making or making tags, but basically um, they're incarcerating you for your free labor. Um, slave passes, you know, you have to have permission to go anywhere. But as we move toward, if, if we're paying attention, we look around, we, we're living in a military state, and it's just, they're gradually increasing that, and then they come up with these they, uh, uh, news events that frightens people, so it allows them to be more accepting. So, and it's interesting, so black people are afraid of terrorists, when, but they're not afraid of the U.S. government, the people who are truly terrorizing them in their own neighborhoods. But it's the slave passes, you know, different forms of that, like the restrictions in terms of your travel and having to have ID for everything, you know, it con it just continues in a different format. Uh, Bloody Sunday, part of, you know, one of the many stories of the civil rights movement, um, goes on and on. They And they still reenact that, I think. Uh, older people are still who remember it, commemorate it, but for a lot of our younger people, um, not really knowing what's going on. But then, if, when our children don't know, it's a, our failure because it's our job to teach them. Unless we teach them, they won't know. If we send them to public schools, they're definitely not going to know. Um, so, but again, that comes back to us knowing our story and making sure we pass it on. Um, the film birth of a nation, you know, interesting, that was a film in the early 20th century, and black people who are knowledgeable about it, you know, this is like the ultimate uh, uh, film of hatred against our people, you know, stereotyping or characterizing us as uh, criminals, um, immoral, all of this, but you know, that was one movie. We, we see the same thing. We just see it spread out in TV programs and movies today. So, you know, no need for us to, um, but something for us to remember. Because, I mean, it, again, like Roots, I guess it would be similar to Roots, having clear, a clear visual of something that went on. Um, Colored only, white only signs on the, my T-shirt, but those, you know, as I said, segregation is good. Inferior uh, resources, not good. Uh, the whippings and, um, you know, any movie that depicts that, again, is good for our children. Um, 
being disenfranchised, not being able to vote, you know, the laws that we would receive 40 acres in a mule, we're still waiting on that. Uh, that and that was the original, what was originally was supposed to be our reparations. Um, and even the land that we bought, uh, we worked hard and bought ourselves, we are practically a landless people, although at some point in our story after the Emancipation Proclamation during the Reconstruction and afterward, we amassed land, but they have legally and illegally stolen it from us over the years. And when uh, the black farmers recently won this uh, lawsuit after years and years, many of the farmers dying before they ever received a settlement, you know, it was in no way um, comparable to what uh, they should have received. But again, you know, trying reparations is just trying to repair things that can't be repaired. But of course, there is no sincere attempt on their part to repair. Because of course, they want to say, oh, it wasn't me, I, I shouldn't be penalized for what my great great grandparents did. But we're being penalized. And definitely, um, our children and that continues as long as we're in a state of oppression that you know continues. Uh, the Nazis on the list, FBI, discrimination, uh, our ancestors who were assassinated, um, you know, being counted as three-fifths of a clause, and um, one of the points he has, let me not say he, I don't know, it could have been a sister who did the t-shirts, just a t-shirt, I don't know, but uh, that we have been quote-unquote niggerized, uh, which I guess my word for that would be menacide, where um, we're acting like someone else. We're not acting uh, out of our African selves. And I think uh, uh, there's a good reason for that. The reason being that uh, having been stolen from our homeland, our language is stolen, our names, our spiritual systems, our culture, uh, our African mind. So you subject somebody to this type of brutality, uh, surprise, surprise, they lose who they are. We've lost our African minds, our African spirit. Uh, you know, even physical things have been taken from us. Those of us who are, have light complexions and uh, textures of hair that are not traditionally uh, our hair and our complexion, the way that we eat. So all of those things who made us who we are, you know, have been taken from us. And I uh, definitely would like to say that um, it's interesting. We're told to forget how important that is. And um, the Jews who own the different forms of media, they're constantly telling their people never forget. And to this day, they're hunting down uh, men in their 90s, whatever. They will never forget, never forgive. Yet, since we have lost our African minds, we are happy to forgive and forget. And it's like, uh, I watch the news regularly, whenever something is done to our people, for example, uh, the number of different brothers who've been falsely uh, convicted of crimes that they didn't do, um, serve 20 or more years in prison, the first thing that comes out of their mouths is they forgive the people. Uh, a young brother right now, and I don't know if it's to the same degree, but he was accused of his a white female classmate who had invited him over. When her dad found out, she accused him, her father accused him of rape, and she testified against him. And that story unraveled when she Facebooked him. And he's out, he's getting ready to play for some, or try out for some NFL team. But nonetheless, people can destroy you, and we have been so taught to forgive. Now, we definitely don't want to be uh, like Europeans, but in, in the respect, just the perspective of 
never forgetting. We should never forget or forgive. And in fact, there's a poster in our classroom, one of the classrooms, a uh, picture of an enslaved African with a tree on his back. You know, uh, people know the uh, some of our ancestors' backs were so scarred from the repeated beatings that it looked like branches of a tree. But the uh, caption says, the victim usually forgives, but the perpetrator rarely repents. And, you know, any verbal repenting, which we're hearing a lot of the states and different, they want to apologize for what happened to us. An apology can't do it. Uh, you know, uh, we should never forget, never forgive. Hotel Warriors, <clears throat> um, I don't really think that I need to go over any more reasons why, even though I know that EDI could probably spend a few months um, going down a very, very long list of reasons as to why we should um, receive reparations without even having to ask. And that would really still only touch the tip of the iceberg because I'm quite sure that the vast majority of the evidence we haven't even heard yet. So we, but we do know, we do, we do feel it. And I shouldn't even have to say feel it because obviously for people to be brought to the position that we are on this planet, not just here, and any of course, is just talking about here in this particular country. For the for the most part, this is this is a global phenomenon. Just talking to the students yesterday about it's bad here. Well, it's worse in England for Africans, and England makes I mean Australia makes England look like well, I shouldn't say Disney World because that's that's faggot orientation, but um, it makes it look like paradise relative to here. There's a, there's a reason why. Uh, drug addiction is so high, particularly crack among young uh, Africans in Australia. Why suicide is so high there is not uh, funny. So even though we're sitting here um, looking, at each, at looking at each other, knowing that this is uh, a serious, beyond serious front line and that we are in horrible shape relative to the state of sovereignty, um, that we were and that we aspire to. We have to understand that this is not not um, just here. This is a global phenomenon. There's a reason why there's a Black Panther Party in India. Um, so so um, the reparations of what they have done in, in a, more than a real sense is global, but we're just focusing on, on here for the day, but folks cannot lose or not uh, attain a Pan-African perspective on this or it's going to be very, very limited in terms of what um, we understand and what um, what um, we demand. This, this is this is not something that we need to ask for. This is something that we demand. When you talk about the Japanese and you talk about the, the European Jews. Uh, they didn't ask. There's a, there's a very strong correlation between power of the motherland and the treatment of their children in other places. The Japanese begin to receive reparations from the United States. They receive reparations from Los Angeles. They receive reparations from the state of California. And they receive reparations from the federal government of this country because the United States had become a debtor nation to Japan. And it's because uh, America was feeling all wonderful and white folks said, okay, well, you know, we did bad. Let's give us money. No. They saw what Japan could do to them financially. And suddenly they realized, um, oh, well, we might need to do something in terms of reparations for the Japanese that we interned during World War II. Same thing um, applies in terms of European Jews as they became a global power as an ethnic group within the European nation. Um, so there's a strong connection. We can even look back to the 1960s and the and, and really seven well 60s and 70s in terms of the decolonization of African African nations and our treatment here started with just only us doing this work of picketing and all the rest of the stuff which obviously doesn't save Europeans unless it hits them in the pocket and even then they figure it's not going to last for that long and once they give in to this then um, we'll say okay and then they can they can they can screw us in some other way 
So a lot of what we received, if you want to call these things that we received, because you have to ask who's asking for these things also. I wasn't a sub-integrationist asking to be allowed into their swimming pools or into their schools or any of the rest of that. Uh, one of the main reasons why we received is because these African nations were becoming, were liberating themselves from European power. And Europeans were concerned about their ability to continue to steal resources from the continent if the Africans there saw their brothers being treated, brothers and sisters being treated like crap, if you will, all around the planet. So they began, that was also part of the move to make sure that we receive some of our quote-unquote civil rights because they were very much afraid. And then as soon as, if we're paying attention, as soon as, neocolonialism was strongly in place, then those civil rights began to erode in terms of the vast majority of us, those of us who hadn't found a way to sneak into the bedrooms. The rest of us um, ended up feeling the brunt of that, that um, uh, um, white supremacy, aspirations of white supremacy, the continued destruction, the continued genocidal destruction of African people. So when I look at reparations, the I, I just have a bunch of questions because um, my my responsibility for this presentation was supposed to be how much. Any any other presentation was supposed to be about why, and I was supposed to come on this and and um, identify how much. But every time I think about this, I keep coming up with questions. I don't, I don't come up with answers. I'm not coming up with figures. And I've seen figures and, you know, the trillions, the billions, the trillions, and all the rest of that. But I keep coming up with questions because mainly when you're talking about these figures that people give, it's mainly based upon economics. It's mainly based upon the income of what Africans would have made. So you'd have calculations like, well, if Africans in today's income had been on plantations doing this kind of labor, then they would have been receiving so much, so many dollars per hour. And since there were 12 generations and so many years involved in the enslavement of African people, that times five-day work weeks or seven-day work weeks, usually five-day work weeks, um, minus in, in minus or not minus taxation, and that means that African people should receive so much money and this money should be divided up amongst all the Africans uh, who exist in the country. These are, these are the economic calculations. To me, those are, are weak. Those are the ones that they want us to pay attention to. Those are the ones that they want us to stay focused on, the same way they want us to stay focused on what happened on the slave ships instead of what happened in the dungeons where more of us died, many more of us died, many more of us were murdered in on the slaves. So they have us, when, when they're caught in the trap of having to admit or acknowledge that they were involved in the destruction of African people, then they look for that aspect of that destruction, which leaves them looking the least guilty. So they want to look at that part of the reparations when they want to look at it. And obviously they don't want to look at it very hard, and too many of us are fighting for them not to look at it. When they do look at it, they're looking at that part of the reparations which would cost them the least. And what would cost them the least, believe it or not, is that income. When we look at the court cases today, we look at, look at their court system, and we have to use that as a model. It's the same thing when we say, uh, when you have these, these uh, Europeans running around today saying, oh, well, I wasn't um, involved in the, in the enslavement of African people. I didn't have a plantation. Um, I wasn't directly involved. That was my, you know, great-great-grandfather or great-great-great-whoever. Uh, when we look at their court system, we see that the person who receives stolen property receives the same sentence as the person who stole the property. So they would receive the same sentence as So they have to keep us focused on the folks who, quote-unquote, physically did this. And at the same time, um, we have to look at how their courts work how their court systems work, what they look at. And when you look at what's going on or has been going on for a long time in lawsuits, uh, a good percentage of the money, usually more than for the actual damage itself, is the money that is sought and collected for damages. That's for pain and suffering. That's where most of the money comes in court cases for the pain and suffering, not for the car that was that was dented all up or the or the, 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 the house that was damaged or for whatever property was, was hurt or destroyed. Most of the money to whoever wins the case comes in the form of 
um, pain and suffering. So we start asking ourselves, what is it that they owe us? The first thing that ought to pop into our minds is how much is the pain and suffering worth? How much? How much do we need to calculate into the equation in terms of that? And that always brings to me to, my, to mind for me the question of if they even have enough money to pay us back. If the entire European nation even has enough money to pay us for the pain and suffering, because I really ha have not been able to to figure out a way to calculate uh, a murder in terms of cost. I, I don't know how you would calculate that in monetary in a monetary amount because not only was that person murdered as I've mentioned before but every individual that that person was supposed to bring into existence was murdered also how do you, how do you calculate that in, in capitalist dollar amounts how do you how do you put a figure um, on that amount in, in terms of, of, of that person being murdered how do you how do you put a dollar amount on a murder on the on the um, just conscious, willful, barbaric murder of an individual. Plenty of forethought, just, just, just removed the person from existence. Took this individual and tossed him over the side of the, 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 the boat for the shark. Just shot this person for target practice. Uh, worked this person to death. Average lifespan in Haiti, Haiti is, was seven years from the time of arrival. How do you calculate just that? Just the murder of these individuals. How do you calculate that in terms of dollar amounts? Um, and I believe I just said they don't. They don't have enough. How do you how do you calculate that? How do you calculate the pain and suffering that went along with having to work from before the sun came up to after the sun came down? How do you how do you calculate the worth of the lives of the babies that were put in the shade of a tree on a plantation? in sort of a, a gully to keep them cool while their mothers went to the field because the mothers couldn't stay there with them. The mothers had to go work in the fields. And the fields were a good bit away. And the clouds came. And this is a true story. And it thundered and the lightning and it rained. And the mothers began to run regardless of what the overseer said. They ran to their babies, and by the time that they got there, the gully had been flooded. How do you, um, how do you pay for that? How do you, how do you calculate uh, a dollar amount for the life of those babies, for the pain and suffering to their mothers, for the pain and suffering to their fathers, their grandparents, their brothers, their sisters, the entire community, the African world. How do you calculate? How do you even begin to put together an equation on a board someplace to say that they owe this amount for just one of those lies? Just one of those lies. So I, I have more questions than I have answers in, ter in terms of amount. They don't, they don't have enough. They don't have anywhere near enough. As far as I'm concerned, they don't have enough to pay for one of the lies. One African that was murdered, and according to the calculations that I live with, you're talking about 280 million African people who were murdered, murdered in the process of the Middle Passage from the point of capture to the point of arrival on these shores. So how do you, how do you, that's two, already 280 million people. If that was just one dollar per person, that's already 280 million dollars. And we know that, that lives, just the lives themselves, will be worth so, so, so much more. And then we can begin to talk about the pain and suffering uh, involved. Um, one of our most brilliant ancestors, Bobby E. Wright, made a, made a statement at, in the last paragraph of his um, essay on menticide, which I said before and I'll say again, it's, it's very strange to me that that's his most important essay. It's no, no, not, not a great deal longer than any of the others, but it's the most important essay that he ever wrote. And it's the essay that deals with, explains that concept of menticide. And it didn't make it into that short book, menticide, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, what is it? Psychopathic Racial Personality and other essays? The Psychopathic Racial Personality and other, it didn't make it in there. But in the last paragraph, and people who have read that essay 
scholars who have written this, and they talk about the mental side, and they explain the mental side, but they don't talk about his last paragraph in that essay, which to me is, is pretty much the most important part in there, and I understand why they're not saying it, because it would turn so many people against Bobby E. Wright, because he wasn't forgiving and forgetting. Bobby E. Wright said, blood debts have to be repaid in blood. He said, blood debts have to be repaid in blood. He didn't say some of them. He said blood debts. We have to realize this is, um, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to figure out also, how, how are you going to repay the universe? Because this, this is a crime not just against African people. We're, in, a, in a real sense, we're secondary. The primary victim of this um, destruction of African people is the universe. The universe was unbalanced. The universe had cracks put in it. They made the universe unbalanced. How do you pay that back? I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Bobby E. Wright is correct. Well, no, I'm not maybe. I know he's correct because everybody else goes along those rules except for us. Everybody else understands that blood debts must be repaid in blood. We think that blood debts must be repaid in prayer. Blood debts have to be repaid in blood. So how do we calculate how many Europeans need to be removed? Because that would have to be part of the reparations. If we want full reparations, now we want just partial piecemeal reparations. If we want bits and pieces here and there, if you want a few dollars, if we want a, a Cadillac, if we want to have uh, tuition paid in a college and then end up going to work for them and be the best consumers in the world so they can get back 100,000 times as much as was paid for the college tuition, um, if we want real reparations, not reparations that come from the U.S. government that is taken from our tax dollars, so it's paid back, what we put in is what's paid back to us, like in the cities where cops kill black males and it's done wrongly and it's proven wrongly. Well, I shouldn't say it's done wrong. It is done wrongly. And it's proven wrongly in the courts and the parents win the case and they're awarded a settlement of, I don't know, $1.2 million for the life of of their son. In these cities, what pays either for the policy in terms of the monthly payments for that policy or the cash amount that's given to those people is paid out of the tax dollars of the people in the city. And the people in the city are black folks. So we're paying for this murderer to murder us. And then we'll get a little change back. So so where is the money for the reparations coming from? This has to come from them. It can't come from us, our tax base. These, these are things I don't... Well, I understand why people don't talk about it. I understand why they can't talk about it. But people don't want to talk about it. Where is this money supposed to come from? If it was cash, where is it supposed to come from? We're the largest per person taxpayer in this country. If you, when you control for income, we are the largest tax-paying group in this country. So the vast majority of the money, just like the vast majority of the money that built the European empire in the first place, came from our backs. So they did it to us, and then we pay ourselves for them doing it to us. Something is wrong in that, in that equation. Something is really, really wrong. So I, I ask people to ask, ask some serious questions. I can't imagine Europeans uh, paying African people any reparations of significance. I didn't say that that's not something that we should fight about. I said I cannot imagine these arrogant children saying, okay, well, not only are we going to correct this, because we've got to remember when you're talking about forgiveness and forgetfulness, then you have to not only... Uh, correct for what was done wrong, you have to stop doing it. And they're so far from stopping doing it. I mean, in any sector that you want to look at, whether you're talking about labor, whether you're talking about diamonds, whether you're talking about um, the, the media, whatever you're talking about, they're not about to stop doing what they're doing to us because this is how they live. This is not a pastime. This is not just uh, avocation, something they do on the side. We are their meat. We are their food. So even if they say, well, we're going to go on a diet so we don't eat so many of y'all, you still haven't stopped. You still continue doing what you're doing. So reparations, I mean, in order for reparations to have any meaning, 
they have to stop what they're doing. And to stop what they're doing is suicide for them. It would be over. They could not continue doing what they do without that. So to, to me, there's so many larger variables than, than, than just a check that the vast majority of us are going to, and I know everybody's heard this before, but the vast majority of us will, will get back to them within a matter of days with the latest shoes, car, chips, uh, homes, um, anything but books, of course. Oh, yeah, computers, yeah. We, we definitely have to have the, the um, latest in computer technology to play games, not so that we can communicate better with each other or have constructive uh, discussions instead of engaging ourselves and tear down meaningless, distracted debates. So how do we how do we place a value? How do we place a value on that? I mean, I guess a good exercise would be for you to to look at your spouse, your, your compliment, or look at your your newborn child, or your little girl, or your little boy, or your mother, or your father, or your best friend, the guy or the girl who's standing on the front line right beside you, and figure out how much money if they disappeared right now. How much money would compensate for their life and for the pain and agony that you would feel for the rest of yours? And then, I guess, multiply that by 12 generations and even further back with the assault and what's going on with you relative to them. Because I guess you should only get paid for um, one person, one of those 280 million. Uh, and then also for me, uh, <laughs> I think it's very important for those folks who are doing the work to get the reparations, those folks who believe. I, I can imagine as soon as reparations came out, as small as they may be, assuming that they came, and as I said, I don't believe that they will or they will be so insignificant, it's not funny. I can, I can see on the day that they're handing out the checks, every Negro in America who has been fighting against this, who is sleeping with the enemy, who is doing everything in their power to destroy any African who even thinks about working for the liberation, empowerment, and sovereignty of African people. They'll be elbowing each other, kicking each other, biting each other, tackling each other so they can get a line to get their check. So for me also, there has to be a way to, to, to determine who really should be receiving this. And I think that that's something that's important. I think that that should be part of the political equation. The rest of the, the, rest of the folks' money can be held in escrow until they receive consciousness because we also have to consider in this equation the mental side. We, 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 we have to consider the degree to which they have destroyed our minds. How do you, how do you put that into an equation? How do how do we make um, how do we how do we incorporate mentorside, cultural misorientation? How, how do we how do we uh, create a, uh, an equation that includes them in the formula so that the the, the, the magnitude just, just just simply as warriors who have who have come out of out of chaos who have come out of the abyss of a Eurocentric insanity? How much how much compensation? Should there be for the life before waking up and the struggles that go with gaining and maintaining an African center? Because they took that from us. How much compensation do you get for, for a loss of your name? That's interesting. We're, 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 it's almost like we're giving them reparations and paying them for changing our names back or changing our names to something that, that we know we're believed to be African. We're paying them. For something that they stole from us. So, so how do you how do you calculate that? How do you calculate um, the loss of a name, the loss of knowing who you are, the loss of knowing your family, the loss in many cases of knowing the Creator? How do you compensate for that? How do you how do you compensate for all of the lynchings of men and women? And children, without saying, yeah. How do you, how do you compensate for that? We, we, we often forget, of course, that there were children that were lynched too. Most of us will forget that there were women that were lynched. How do you comp
compensate for that? How do you compensate for the pain and suffering of warriors now trying to do this work? Being overcharged, being dismissed, being looked down upon by other African people. Because that need to be worked into the equation too, pi square something for the pain and suffering that we receive from our families for trying to be African. And this is all a result of Europeans. It's not, I'm not looking at these family members and say, oh, bad, because they're meant to sidle. So they need to be compensated for that. But we need to be compensated for receiving the brunt of their menticide because they don't have anywhere else to vent. And if they were, if they thought to vent against Europeans, that thought would be quickly shut down because they know in the back of their minds that Europeans will kill them for nothing and they don't want to have to engage that threat. They don't have to deal with that at all. I've heard lots of ideas about reparations. Uh, we need to get a chunk of the infrastructure of the West, so half or, or a third of the industry in, in Western society should immediately come under our control. Uh, so many states should belong to us. That's, that's reparations, which, which to me is, is um, and I know I usually get in trouble for this, but to me that's sort of ludicrous. It's like you don't know the Europeans. You're going to control this area. You have no reasonable military whatsoever. And you're going to establish a territory within European territory where you're going to create an economy that's going to allow you to separate yourself from them. And they're going to allow it. I've never known them to allow the creation of any kind of sustainable economy within their economy unless they felt some kind of threat that did not allow them to come in and stop it. And that's never been the case for us. We can go down a list of those establishments, those um, um, groups who put together land, space, et cetera, et cetera, and made it clear that they were not in love with Europeans. And they shut it down. They shut down their own. When one of their own is going against them, or one of their own, one of the dispossessed is going against those who are possessed, those who are in power. We have to remember that, that the, the Maafa is not over. The destruction of African people, and if we look on the continent, we could even argue that it's escalating. Even though we often forget that the scrabble never ended. So I, how do you um, make reparations for all of the children and adults who uh, died of starvation in so many different African countries. How, how do you compensate for that? How do you compensate for the removal of the Tasmanians from the planet, period, where there are no more of them, they don't exist? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you compensate for that? How do you compensate for the, the killing off of an entire group of people, an entire group of Africans. How do you how do you um, how do you make amends for that? Now, I know how Europeans will make amends for that. If it was their own, then they would be about the business of finding a way. If it took them a zillion years of finding a way to remove the people who removed them from existence, they would find a way. And the historical record shows that they did this over and over and over and over and over again. I don't know of any situation where there were a group of, group of Europeans who were killed. Um, and of course, in 99% of these cases, it was because they were somewhere that they, did, they didn't need to be. And they were manufacturing laws that the people who they were dealing with didn't know about, and then when they did something that they shouldn't have been doing, then they cried foul. But regardless of how these Europeans were killed, and I would argue that all of them were killed justly, um, there is no situation I'm aware of, somebody would have to bring that to me, that I'm aware of where Europeans didn't retaliate with murderous intent where they went about the business of trying to kill any and everybody there. Reminds me of, um, I mean, you, you, you see them in the, in the, the movie, and I know this isn't a, this isn't a discussion about the murdering rage of Europeans, but um, what was the, the name of that movie? The Usual Suspects, 
where the the guy who was was the bad guy um, in the movie in the end you you just not in the end you discovered that this guy nobody could find him nobody could see him these guys wanted his territory and they came in and 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 you know took his children and and raped his wife and they were in his house and when he came in the door they they shot one of his children and maybe shot another one have you and this this guy is standing there and he shot two of them excuse me he they said now he wanted to show them what courage or what have you was about so he shot his wife his other children and then shot two of the guys and told the other one to go give a warning to these people and then they said he went and killed them killed all of their relatives killed all of their business associates, killed everyone who they did business with, and then disappeared. That's the European. That's the European mindset. Our mindset is to, as any I was saying, walk out of prison after we've lost our lives, not just part of it, coming out with maybe $10,000, maybe a small lawsuit, and saying, oh, I forgive the people who did this to me, who are never going to see a second inside of prison who are never going to receive any quote-unquote justice. People do this to us, and we, we pray to have their sins forgiven. This is the model. I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in uh, Bobby E. Wright's philosophy. That's, that's part of it. But until you correct it in such a way that people do not dare to touch you, to touch your children, to touch your people until you are in a position to do that, the money's not going to do you any good because they can come and take your money. I'm in the domain. They can come and take your home. You go buy your new $400,000, $400 million home, and they can come and take it tomorrow, talking about eminent in the domain. Or the bank can take it from you. Or your records can get lost. You don't, you don't operate the information system. That's theirs, which means that you can disappear on paper. <coughs> Excuse me. With that said, and I'm, I'm glad that most of the time was taken up by any y'all because it's like in any class, you have to give people who may be in doubt so much information that they have to go back before they can come back. So I think that if there's anybody listening who has issues with reparations or, or thinks that we, or is on here just to find out something or to, or to, to, to make this into a wrong thing, they may give them some, some homework to do before they'll be able to come back and, and respond to that correctly. Uh, but before we uh, close this out, I want to make a, a few announcements, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, we have a course coming, and interestingly, there's so many things in the universe within, within our community that seem to be happening at the right time. Um, I've been planning on this course for a number of years now, and um, some people made the point that this needs to, to happen, and this was a, a good number of months ago, and now, of course, all the events that are occurring, um, sometimes people are being surprised by them. I really don't know why. I don't know why people are surprised about homo marriage. I don't know why people are surprised about black males claiming to be men, talking about I'm a fag. I don't, I don't know why people are surprised at this. This is to be expected because we have moved further and further into their insanity. And that is a way to receive recognition, especially if you want to be them. So I have a course coming up this summer that begins June the 4th goes through July the 9th. This will be the first six-week week, six week course I've done in a number of years. I've been doing four-week courses over the, uh, for the last couple of years or so. But this is the first six-week course because I want to make sure I covered what I wanted to cover. And the name of this course is Sexual Insanity. It's a six-week course. The first two weeks I'm going to be uh, discussing, elaborating on this, the book, The Sex Imperative. The next two weeks I'm going to be dealing with the book, Homosexuality and the Feminization of African Males. The next week, I'm going to be dealing with the book Urugu's Unix. And the final week, I'm going to be talking about solutions. So this is online class. All my classes online are held at the site of bbtumikasa.com. Um, the classes are $10 per class or $50 in advance for all six classes. 
And uh, if you want to know how to register, because this is a long address, just send me an email. Hit me up on. Uh, I'm sounding like young folks. Hit me up. Hit me up on um, uh, Facebook, um, and I will give you whatever details that you need. The class is held. Also, I forgot to say, from 7:30 to 9 o'clock. That, those are Tuesday nights. So it's from 7:30 to 9 o'clock. Um, at night, and that's a six-week course. I'll be talking about the sex imperative, homosexuality, and the feminization of African males, and the Urugu Unix books. Um, also, which is uh, more important at this particular moment, we are in the throes of a the first annual Akaban Institute fundraising drive. Uh, we are so so honored by the people who put the work into making this happen because we really didn't have the time. But we have some people who are really involved in this all over the place. Uh, this will culminate. It'll, it'll come to an a, a end, if you will, even though people can't continue to contribute, on June the 1st with a fundraising concert here in Atlanta from, what, 4 in the afternoon to 10 at night. Um, it's going to be at Morris Brown uh, College's Cunningham Auditorium here in Atlanta, Georgia. The admission here, if you go into the concert, is $10 per person. Children under 12 are free. And we're going to have Star, Ross Kofi, Kenneth Zaki, Rod Black Diamond, and it'll be hosted by DJ Fourth World. Of course, Mama Rimble, whole host of folks will be there. Um, for folks who are not here who want to assist, and we expect... Um, all warriors who believe in what we're doing, because warriors should know that we don't accept funds from any government agency. We've never received a grant. What did um, Khalid say? It's over here on this thing. He said, uh, uh, I don't want to work in corporate America. I don't want no grant. I don't want them to finance me. I don't want him to fund me. All I want to do is give him hell all the days of my life. That's what Khalid Muhammad said, and that's pretty much my philosophy, too. Um, so we expect warriors who say that they're warriors, who are acting like warriors, to assist us. And by assistance, we mean anywhere from a dollar to whatever the sky's limit is. Um, often folks think that when it's not in a large amount, $50, $75, $100, $200, that they're not doing anything. Uh, a dollar helps. A dollar buys pencils. A dollar buys paper. A dollar does a lot of good. So anything that you are able, and we don't want people to pull out more than they're able, anything that you are able to assist us with will be helpful. If we operate as a community and everybody's giving what they can um, to assist us, then we will, we will at least come close, if not go over, what we need to do the work that needs to be done here for this year. Well, at least for the next academic year. If you um, want details, if you want to see what we do here at Ackerman Institute, there is a YouTube video. Just um, I guess Google and Wallamu Baruti or go to YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. Go there, and there's a um, presentation about Ackerman Institute here. There's also a short of uh, video. Excuse me. Spell Ackerman A K O B E N A K O B E N Institute. Um, and she has a parenthesis, uh, plug in Akabit Institute Fundraiser, and it will take you to that video. Um, also, there are things posted on my Facebook page. Also, just email me if, if that's what you want to do. You can also um, uh, go, to, go to PayPal. And on PayPal, if you want to go straight PayPal and do, do your thing there, then... The email address on PayPal is yabaruti at yahoo.com. That's Y-A-A-B-A-R-U-T-I at yahoo.com. And, of course, we have a uh, level of um, uh, donations. So if you give a donation of $20 to $49.99, then we send you an ABB for Hodier band, which I really like these bands. Um, they're, they're, they're nice. Um, excuse me? Oh, BB for ODA meaning, and one side it says a BB for ODA, and the other side it says um, African liberation, which is what a BB for ODA means. If you donate or contribute $50 to seventy four ninety nine, you get a band and a copy of my book, Sesh, 
If you donate $75 or more, you get the band, you get a copy of Cess, and you get a copy of Message to the Warriors. So we're looking forward to reaching our goals. We're looking forward to assisting the community so that we can do our work for the community, for the front line, um, better. Uh, so with that said, um, I think it's time for us to to go. In fact, I have less than a minute to, to go here. Uh, we, we, we definitely appreciate you all beyond fundraising, beyond anything, because without the Warriors, uh, it's a waste. It's, it's, it's really a waste. And as some folks think about reparations, they know that it's something that we more than deserve for the reasons that NER gave, plus thousands of more. And they will think about what um, uh, reparations should entail. Because it can't just be be money um, or what have you. So um, I need to get the phone back to uh, NEI. So. One closing thought. Of course, as been said, they can't repair us. But the work that Ankaben Institute is doing and all of you, whatever work you're doing, wherever you are, this is how we repair ourselves. We've been injured by others. They can't and won't repair us in any way. We have to repair ourselves and supporting each other. You know, whether we go into black businesses, our institutions, that's that's the reparations that we can count on. We can't count on anyone else. We can't, the person to, who injured us is not going to be the person who heals us. It's our nation building work. And on that note, we like to say, a BB BB for ODA, ODA family. African liberation. The assault against African centeredness is increasing in size and magnitude. There's a lot of fear in our community. There's a lot of need to be validated and loved by enemies in our community. There's a lot of need to work on who you are because it is something that you despise. So our hatred and metricide are deep. And it seems like they're growing deeper. But what I see in front of me tells me that it's not victorious. And there's one person sitting here, and that means that we haven't lost. We have a lot of work to do, and we need to focus our attention on our children, because they're the ones who are the primary targets. But on this yeah. issue, and every other issue of insanity, it turns us into somebody who we are not. If we're going to win, we have to produce warriors. Initiated, student of the EWA, so baptized by the warrior teachers. I'm trained and learning how to shoot the cage while you burn the same plane video games. This message here is for the RPG Brigade. Share blood, bring the peace, that's the warrior's way. Libation is the blood, sweat and tears. EYA, I say I'm bringing death to the quiz. I want to live, so I die for the kids. Black smack gangsters coming home from bids. Free your dome, you only hard to kill your own. A straight race trailer, the white man's clone. Burrito man, I'ma continue to plan. Choke the life out of a cracker, grip my bed.